Good morning. Uh, so uh, this is a session about uh, an update to what we've been doing with the AS so far uh, between ARM and Lenaro, um, along with some of our members. Uh, my name's Amit Kucheria. I'm tech lead for the power management working group at Lenaro. Uh, we have uh, Robin Randava, uh, who's uh, the tech lead on the ARM side of uh, the power management team. And we have Ian uh, Rickards, who's the uh, engineering manager. Product manager, sorry, um, uh, and he's he's been engaging with a lot of the members and the partners uh, uh, on getting EAS technology into their products. Um, so I'm going to let uh, Ian and Robin actually uh, do a lot of the talking, uh, which is probably as well because I don't feel like I could talk for 15 minutes something in the air conditioning. Uh, so EAS has been uh, about o a little over two years in development. Um, for those of you who are actually following uh, what's going on on the lists, uh, we've seen that for the last uh, three to four merge windows, we, we are actually getting stuff, bits and pieces merged every single merge window. We're getting uh, code around, uh, uh, so a lot of the CPU capacity calculation work, uh, the frequency invariance work um, uh, has, has been merged. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of outstanding patches around uh, moving, uh, um, the DVFS mechanisms, the policy around the DVS, DVFS mechanism, what we like to call a SCED DVFS, uh, those have been reviewed a few times. I think we've, uh, version three of the patch set was reviewed uh, and then discussed uh, widely at LPC, uh, Plumbers Conference. Um, and then there's the uh, energy model. Uh, so what, what is the core of EAS? Uh, that's already seen version V5. It's being discussed ex extensively on the list. And very recently, ARM uh, posted out the SCED tune patches, so the set of tunables that we feel uh, might be necessary around uh, to, to replace uh, some of the governors that we are used to, interactive governor and so on and so forth. Uh, we have, we have a, a couple of uh, places where all of the discussion happens, LKML being the primary source of uh, a lot of these discussions. Uh, but there's also a EAS dev mailing list for people who want to uh, um, uh, discuss these within, within the membership uh, and not, not directly go to LKML. So uh, feel free to join those as well. Uh, with that, I'll hand over to uh, Ian. Thanks, Amit. So uh, my name's Ian Rickards. I'm the product manager for uh, EAS. And I think some of you guys might be new to this, so I'm going to do some of the background slides. Then we'll hand over to Robin for a bit more of the technical detail. OK, so, um, so the background, really, and motivation for EAS is that um, the CPU topologies have been increasing in complexity. We've seen uh, multi-cluster SMP. Of course, SMP is still very popular. Multi-cluster SMP, big little. We've even seen tri-cluster launched into the market in the last year. So lots of interesting CPU topologies and um, per core, per cl cluster, DVFS. So um, we really want to optimize the, the energy consumption of these advanced ARM SOC systems. So, uh, so we wanted to launch uh, energy aware scheduling as a kind of more generic way to handle these the broad range of topologies. Um, and we also wanted to see that move into the, the, the mainline kernel. So, so we've been discussing this for, for quite a while, as Amit mentioned. You know, there's been some initial discussions back in 2013 between Morton, the other, other guys, and um, the scheduler maintainers like Ingo Molnar, and the comment over on the right-hand side there, um, we call the, the line in the sand uh, email from, from Ingo that basically says that uh, he wants to see them in integrated together into uh, idle, uh, the DVFS CPU freak, and um, bringing that all together and really integrated into the scheduler because these idle frameworks and uh, DVFS have really been bolt-ons. So bring them together and have a much more coordinated approach um, where the scheduler is really front and center and is much more aware of the power management. So, and it minimizes the software costs. Okay, so actually there's been some great progress uh, in 2015. So our RFC V5 posting in July 
basically integrates uh, pretty much all the functionality, all the basic functionality. So EAS is kind of alive now, which is good. Um, we've had some great uh, collaboration with Linaro, so the, the work's been divided up between ARM and Linaro. Uh, we've been working on landing it on a Chromebook platform, so if you look at the Chrome OS Garrett, you'll see that EAS is actually in there. And um, so and Chrome OS is actually a great platform to try and land this on first because it's close to upstream, and um, we'll then be turning our attention to Lin um, Android next. So, and there's a blog post actually that Amit's just put up on the Linaro website uh, explaining some of the latest, the latest news as well. And this presentation is kind of similar to the blog post. Okay, so the goal is to integrate idle uh, DVFS and big little support into, into the scheduler, make it front and center um, with a clean design using a generic approach rather than some magic tunables and use an energy model to control all the decision-making process. And the idea is that you know, once you've written the energy model, then that, that controls all the decision-making and um, you don't need magic tunables. So just to kind of look, look around this diagram and show how we've kind of divided up the work so that the energy model itself has been done by ARM in the blue, uh, the scheduler DVFS, is, um, I would say, mostly Linaro, but we've, we've done some ARM enhancements to that. Um, Idle is from, from Linaro, so th thank you, Nicholas. Um, performance enhancements, so when we did HMP, the GTS software for HMP, we basically looked at some, some basic functionality that we were expecting, and we had to add some enhancements to support each of the features we were expecting. So some of the HMP performance enhancements come into EAS as well. Tunability, uh, so this is an interesting point where the maintainers really want to see a, a very simple tunable where you go between energy efficiency on one hand or maximum performance on the other hand with just a single tunable. Um, Robin will talk a bit more about that later. Analysis and tuning flows, so we've actually developed some, um, some tools. There's uh, Trappy and BART, which uh, Patrick is going to talk about in one of the hacking sessions. Um, and we're working further on that. Tools, we've got the RT app um, workload generator, which is from Linaro. And basically that allows you to create lightweight workloads uh, that um, will exercise EAS. Because a lot of um, you know, existing benchmarking is about maximum performance. For, for EAS, we want a kind of repeatable, uh, lightweight workload generator. Okay, so just, just a bit of background about power on CPUs. So uh, I think this, this might be interesting for you just to kind of set the scenes. So, um, so you basically have a combination of static power consumption and dynamic power consumption. Static power basically goes with the area of the silicon, so the size of the CPU, the threshold voltage, which is part of the implementation. So when someone implements an ARM, ARM core, they can decide whether they want to go for maximum performance uh, with a low VT, which means higher leakage, or high VT, which is a lower maximum performance, but lower leakage. <coughs> okay, temperature factors into it. Dynamic power is all about the, the capacitance of the, the, the lines on the chip and the voltage swing and how often that happens. So it's the frequency times the capacitance times the voltage. So what that means is for a bigger CPU core, more complex microarchitecture, you've got obviously more, um, more capacitance and therefore more, more power consumption. Okay. So, so basically, we, we're all familiar with DVFS, where you've reduced the voltage and uh, reduced the frequency, and that reduces the dynamic power. So that's one way of power saving. Uh, the more fundamental way of power saving is to mix big cores and little cores together, where the simpler microarchitecture of a, a little core means that, obviously, the signals, uh, there are fewer signals, they're, they're shorter signal um, traces, and 
basically the, the, the design of the core is much simpler. You have a register file with fewer read and write ports. You have less multi-issue, less speculation. So really fundamental reasons why little cores are always going to be more efficient than big cores, even running at lower frequencies. So j just a bit of background that shows how DVFS is important and how the microarchitecture and implementation choices are important. And so this is the, the reasoning behind Big Little, and this is why we need something like EAS to really optimize the, the power consumption and take full advantage of these low OPP points. So what we want to look for in a, an SOC is a, but maybe slightly idealized, but a, a wide dynamic range between uh, performance and, and power. So where you have low performance points, or lo low power points that, that handle very lightweight workloads up to high performance points. Okay, so the existing <coughs> Uh, shed, scheduler, uh, the CFS scheduler basically has a kind of throughput based policy where um, waking tasks are basically spread between CPUs. Uh, there's really no understanding of the power consumption of the scheduling choices. It's just trying to maximize the, the throughput. So um, DVFS and idle is really bolted on and controlled separately, the scheduler isn't aware of any of that. So originally it was designed to get maximum performance out of SMP systems and uh, has no awareness of, of energy. Okay. So when we introduce an energy aware policy, um, we have basically um, some task utilization, so the, the PELT infrastructure, which was added by Google, um, that was kind of used very slightly in, in the scheduler in terms of the, um, the, the, the load balancing, but we introduced it into uh, a wake-up pathways as well. Okay, so you need to understand the, the task utilization, you need to understand the capacity of the CPUs, and you need the energy model. Okay, so, so here's an example of a system where we have big and little cores, so they have different max capacities, that's the, these purple lines. Uh, they have different current capacities based on the current DVFS point, and the waking task can go on any of these cores. So, uh I'd like to re-emphasize the last line in there about supporting all topologies. I've spoken with a lot of members uh, this week and earlier as well, where there's this, this feeling that EAS is only about big little. It's not. So I think uh, if, if, if we go back to look at this, uh, about 90% of the patches are actually about tighter integration between the power management frameworks and the scheduler. And uh, even SMP systems or even uh, multi-core systems which have basically the same micro-architecture uh, should benefit uh, from, from the work that we are doing here. Absolutely. Okay, so when, when you introduce EAS, then we have the energy model which is controlling the decision-making process so we've got a, a waking task of uh, maybe this, this size, which is uh, being scheduled onto this system. And so we've got some loading on the little core, in term, so the little cluster's here. And it's at a low OPP point. The big cluster has a larger task on it, and it's at that OPP point. So basically what happens is EAS gets presented with a choice of which CPU to uh, place this task onto, and the choice is either onto this little core, uh, but move the OPP point up, or it could also fit on core three, which is a big core, within the existing uh, OPP point. So if we look at the curves, this is moving the operating point of uh, the, the little cluster upwards, which will impact the power consumption and of, of the existing task running on CPU zero. Or 
you could just place it on the big core and it stays at the same operating point, but then of course you've got higher power consumption because of the, 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 the increased um, dynamic power consumption because it's a big core. So the energy model will basically get presented with this, these choices and it will decide which is the, the least energy cost for the, the and, and it will do, do make that choice basically. Yeah. Nourish. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I would like to understand here, so every task has to plus place on the littles and uh, according to the operating uh, points, then it has to migrate to big. Sorry. Yes. So, so the problem decomposes into one where the because you have a no notion of um, the utilization of the load weight of a task, right? So it's like what you used over there to say, hey, it's this, this much load, okay? And because you have a notion of capacity now with CPUs, it's basically a fitting problem. You have to decide whether this task can fit on the capacity available on a particular CPU. Yes. That's well and good, but in addition, you also have the energy model telling you, should you decide to do that, what is the energy impact? And on that basis, you decide what is the placement. Okay. Right. So I wasn't sure whether you were trying to contrast with perhaps the GTS worldview where you have thresholds yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah, That essentially goes away. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So, so, so actually, on the, the subject of comparing with um, the HMP GTS patches, so as you know, LSK has. Um, uh, HMP GTS support available already, but it's a non-upstream set of patches, very big little specific, um, doesn't cope with the broader range of topologies. So that, that's the situation at the moment. Big little only, hard-coded, only in LSK, not, not in mainline. So comparison with EAS. So we're working on the upstreaming process, so some of the foundational pieces have gone, gone in already, um, and so this line is mo slowly moving upwards as we get more foundational pieces in, and Robin will talk about that in more detail. Um, we think there are probably a few pieces which won't necessarily get upstreamed immediately, so those will be kind of separate, but they'll be much smaller patch patches, and they could be maintained in LSK, for example, and also, because it's a kind of generic framework, you know, there's nothing to stop partners and OEMs doing their own specific performance tuning on top of that, and, and you know, to, if they want to differentiate, et cetera. So, so it's basically a clean foundation, increasing the, the foundational patches, and Robin will provide more details there, but with um, some of the patches remaining kind of separate, but much simpler maintenance effort. Okay. Right. Well, thank, thank you very much, and I'll hand over to Robin for the, the, the tech detail. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Okay. Uh, I'm going to pick up from where Ian left off. Uh, the objective for me is to try and give you uh, an overview of the features and uh, give you some, um, some idea of you know, what's happened with the upstreaming effort so far. Uh, what's happened with some of the silicon trials we've done with some partners, um, and you know what are the next steps basically, right? So we have a couple of sessions where we're going to deep dive into into this stuff through the week, and uh, you know you should use that opportunity as well. So um, one of the long-standing demands uh, in in the power performance community in Linux was that when it comes to DVFS management, you want to move away from uh, a sampling approach and start doing things in an event-driven fashion. Uh, this, 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 you know, this realization came uh, after, you know, painful realization. Many partners have actually seen that uh, if you have a sampling-driven approach, then you, you know it's kind of difficult to tune for a particular use case for the sampling-driven approach because invariably you have to match the sampling rate to the, the loading trends in your particular use case. So now it becomes uh, uh, an involving decision where you know should I have a higher sampling rate or a lower sampling rate with my CPU freak governor? If I have a rate that's too high, I might be getting too trigger happy. If it's too low, then there's a latency impact, and you might not pick up on load trends soon enough kind of thing. So everyone agreed that we need to move to an event-driven approach. Uh, we worked with uh, our friends in Leonardo to come up with uh, the mechanics of such an approach. 
as uh, Amit mentioned previously, it's called scheduler-driven DBFS. Uh, the idea really is that since the scheduler is now using stuff like per entity load tracking, it's intrinsically better informed about utilization on the systems from a per task standpoint. So when the scheduler sees that the utilization is changing, it's in a position to uh, notify the DBFS framework and actually effect a capacity change right there and then. So the immediate um, sort of effect of this is uh, responsiveness is improved. Right? So um, what we're trying to do is start off with something simple, introduce some very basic examples <coughs> of what the policy aspect on top of this would be, and then test the waters. In our silicon trials, we've been doing this. Uh, some of the evaluations seem to indicate that, yes, the responsiveness has improved. Um, when this gets mixed with what I'm going to talk about next, which is shed tuned, we believe we can come up with something that's a little competitive with what partners traditionally use in products, which is <coughs> CPU Freak Interactive Governor. Okay. So another demand. Uh, Ian mentioned Ingo Bolnar's line in the sand comment right in 2013 saying, I want everything driven by the scheduler. But actually much before that, um, people like uh, Peter Gilstra were calling out that I want a central tunable story. Uh, it's often, I think in some mails it was referred to as a central tunable knob or something like that. And he said like, it's a knob with three settings. Either on, in one setting I want energy efficient operation where there's a performance sacrifice. The other setting is I don't care about energy efficiency, I want pause out performance. And the third one, I think he referred to as this auto setting, where he said, like, let user space decide what it wants exactly. Now, that was, people spoke about that in various contexts, but there was no clear understanding of any implementation. Uh, we came up with one idea, and we call that Shed Dune. It, it's trying to implement most of what was uh, sought after by the maintainers, but it's, we've learned a few tricks over here as well. Um, what we've done is, there's a SysFS file, you can write a value from zero to 100 in it. Whatever you write is basically um, proportionally translated into a, an additional boost margin on top of a task's actual load expression, right? So if a, there's, a, if there's a task which has its uh, actual utilization in blue, you add a performance margin on top of that, right? So what does that do? Well, think about it, right? So if by adding a boost value in the sysfs file, you're causing the task's load to be amplified. That means the system now has to make decisions for capacity provisioning on the basis of the amplified load. So that's your performance bias, right? So if the, you start off with zero, all decisions are done using the energy model. You should be energy efficient without sacrificing too much performance. But if you are uh, absolutely clear that I want more performance, you start trending towards 100 and then your task load utilization gets boosted. The system does a lookup and says, hey, this guy's got too much of a utilization requirement. I, I need more capacity. It tells DVFS, increase the OPP. If you run out of capacity on a processor, then you rely on uh, migrating the task to a processor, another processor that actually has the capacity. That's the theory behind this, right? So we came up with two modes. Uh, there's a first RFC of this that Patrick sitting in the audience posted uh, just before the LPC. Um, We've come up with two modes. One is like this global mode and one is this per task mode, right? The, the idea is that the global mode actually provides a, a boost to all tasks in the system. Um, why did we do that? Because if you think about it, that sounds like a, a bit of a sledgehammer, right? But if you think about it, CPU Freak Interactive um, has elements of that sledgehammer approach already, right? If there's a boost, uh, if, if there's a tickle coming in from the touch subsystem, CPU Freak Interactive tries to sort of like just amplify the, the frequency to a suitably high frequency for all tasks in the system for a programmable interval of time. And it hopes that the, the task that had an interactive requirement gets serviced by, by this sledgehammer approach. So we were like, you know, as a stepping stone, perhaps you can emulate the CPU Freak Interactive behavior using this mode, right? But what we are really interested in discussing with people is the, the per task approach. Um, in the per task approach, uh, we've come up with a C group interface right now. You can have multiple C groups. You can have a limited hierarchy of these C groups. You can associate a different boost value with each C group. Now, when you add tasks to these C groups, only those you know, tasks in specific C groups will get boosted accordingly. Um, if you guys, some of you were at the LPC, uh, Google did a presentation on where they showed for 
For the upcoming uh, releases and with Android, they, they put in some big little special casing. Um, in, the, in, in the middleware in Android, they already have a way to tag tasks as foreground tasks or background tasks. So, so what they've started doing is they, um, they have a background C group and they have a CPU set controller there that forces the affinity of any task that's in that background C group onto the little side. We feel that you can quite likely achieve that but using this, right? So there's some discussions underway where we're trying to see whether people can try and uh, use this technique. Uh, this is out as an RFC. There's a really interesting thread with uh, Patrick, Steve, Muckle. Is Steve here? Yeah. yeah right. And Ingo and Peter. I think that's a classic example of the kind of split you have between the upstream intent, where they're like, I want a simple, single tunable, and the product lobby, who is cognizant of the fact that that quite likely is not going to be enough for my product and my use case, so I need a little more than that, right? So this sort of uh, covers that problem space. So we found that, uh, this is slightly contrived, but uh, it, it tells a story, right? So with, with our previous implementation, we had a couple of dozen uh, tunables. The interactive governor has its own. Uh, it's kind of difficult for somebody to reason about, you know, how exactly does a change in one of these tunable impact the system, right? So um, our existing worldview is that, you know, all, all of the tunables in HMP effectively go away uh, if you have the energy model as a replacement. Uh, a lot of the stuff that you have to do with interactive fundamentally boils down to shared tune, but uh, we're cognizant that if you want exactly the kind of behaviors you were comfortable with uh, in terms of, um, you know, like boosting everyone for a particular amount of time, then we might need to implement certain things from uh, analogs to what uh, interactive provides, like boost and boost pulse. But generally, it's trending towards a simpler system, is, is where it's heading in our view. So here, uh, there is no interactive governor tunings in EAs? Yeah, I mean, we are sort of effectively sideswiping the interactive governor, and there's another governor called ShedGov, which is basically uh, trying to just use a little bit of the CPU free core and do everything directly from the scheduler. Okay? So uh, that is also playing with the CPU free uh, up and downs? I'm not sure I follow. I mean, uh, the new schedule, I mean, new scheduler governor, mm -hmm. what you are talking about. So I'm trying to understand how that's going to work in terms of CPU frequency. So is it going to, you know, when you trying to tune it, so is it like tuning the CPU frequency again? Let me try and approach that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I entirely understood the question, but. Uh, so um, that's what we, s we call the SCED DVFS patch set. It basically follows the load curve in the scheduler. So it will automatically uh, try to match uh, your load requirements from the scheduler. You don't need an interactive governor, a separate interactive governor. That, that sort of policy is, is baked into, uh, uh, into the scheduler. Okay, so now I think I understand, understood what you asked. So uh, basically there's, there's a bit of a policy aspect there. Uh, Yuri, who's been working with Mike Turkett to do shared DBFS, uh, he's put in a policy which actually tries to if at a particular capacity point, uh, the load is peaking and it comes to within a fixed threshold of that capacity, we, we've sort of like jumped to the maximum uh, frequency in that domain, right? We could have chosen to just track the load, but doing this gave us the interactive response, slightly closer to what interactive the governor gives you. Uh, and because as opposed to interactive, we are tracking the load of a task, we come back to the actual utilization of the task, the frequency and capacity matching the actual utilization of the task, far better than interactive, which would have gone on using an average view of the world. So we jump to the max OPP with this implementation today. Right? Not everyone likes that. It's an open question whether that's the best way of doing it, but that's why we are. Yes, so the evaluations are still underway. We haven't actually done a, a complex, uh, like a comprehensive comparison with uh, HMP just yet. Well, is it a good idea to compare HMP with uh, EAS or is there any other difference? We can't get out of that one, frankly, right? So because people have used uh, HMP in product, they will treat that as a baseline. The baseline question in itself is interesting because for us the baseline is the mainline kernel, right? We want to improve the mainline kernel. But uh, partners who have deployed HMP want to contrast an EAS implementation against HMP. 
So I have a slide where I'm just discussing some of the ideas we are bouncing around with Lenaro to try and come up with uh, an LSK offering that can help make that comparison. Okay. So I, I was just interested in what happens to CPU intensive processes. Um, so CPU. If you've got a CPU band process, it's load estimate is based on observing the amount of time it has on the CPU. If you set the the boost to zero, will it? What will cause it to leave the little CPU and migrate to a big CPU? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, there is a certain cost aspect to what we're doing as well, right? So you might have a pattern that defeats the existing design. In that, you've got a you've got a batch task that actually is compute heavy, but which you do not want to provide uh, excess compute because you don't, right? Why would you? Why should I put it on a high frequency, uh, more you know, performance oriented processor? Uh, we can solve that problem using the per task approach. At the LPC, there was an interesting, uh, um, so you know how we, we're sort of like boosting from zero to 100 and providing performance. People are pointing out that with the per task approach, we might want to do the opposite. There might be a CPU bound task, and we want to actually force it to stick around somewhere, so we, yeah. want, we want a negative slider that says, you know, <laughs> it's an interesting idea. You basically group all those together into a C group and make sure that Time control which yeah. way they're going to pull. So, yeah. yeah, so as opposed to trying to rely on shed tune and rely on this, that's exactly what we were reasoning about. Why don't you just use, uh, put it into a group, attach an affinity connotation with it, and the problem is solved. The issue there is that you don't have control of the OPP selection. So there are some, some areas which we need to cover better. Okay, so. We've been at it for a while with Big Little MP and now EAS, and all along what we've learned is that you try to, you end up coming up with the same sort of uh, infrastructures for evaluation and analysis, right? People come up with the same sorts of scripts. If you speak to a company X who's done an evaluation with EAS, they come up with the same scripts that we've done fundamentally. So to try and reduce redundancy, you try to come up with tooling that we can uh, socialize externally and other people can use rather than rewriting the same things again and again. So we come up with a whole host of those. Um, all of these are available externally, and I just wanted to just tell you about those. So RT app, workload gen, uh, Linaro took RT app and extended it. We've added some features to it uh, ourselves. RT app is a, it's a, it's a pattern generator, basically. It can allow you to create synthetic load patterns. It's got a JSON grammar where you can uh, specify dependencies between uh, model tasks and so on and so forth. It's very useful. The shed deadline community is where it originated from, so you know the scheduler guys are familiar with that. Um, available, there's a link to a wiki where the Git repository is available. Workload automation is something we came up with in ARM. Yeah, uh, just wanted to mention, so we are using RT app uh, to emulate some of the uh, video and uh, web browsing playback use cases, because uh, we don't always have access to an Android uh, environment uh, during development. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good point. And I suppose like where we are today, and this is a discussion we need to have, uh, we're not sure whether using a tool like RT app to model a complex <coughs> benchmark is actually worth it, right? Because even if you are able to model it, um, the model isn't portable to different systems and stuff like that, right? So the strategy we've adopted is um, do simpler load patterns with RT app. Uh, Try and optimize the scheduler pathway on that basis that you're currently developing. And then see what happens by directly running the macro use case over there and doing some analysis, right? It's kind of a difficult one, man. Um, yeah. I mean, we, we'll never be 100% faithful. Correct. That, that's a given. I suppose what I'm saying is we would much rather encourage people to deploy the benchmarks and use cases they care about full on on the system yeah. and then see whether the synthetic uh, test case driven feature development is paying off or not. And actually workload automation helps with that. So it's a Python framework, it's got uh, a mechanism to abstract uh, use cases, so you can integrate any use case you have very easily with workload automation, whether it's a game or a benchmark or a shell script or whatever. Um, it's got uh, abstractions for target platforms. In fact, they've just modularized workload automation to come up with a module called devlib, which is really interesting. It allows you to just uh, totally abstract out the comms with targets, like uh, any, any board. For a Chrome environment or an Android environment, you can handle all of that. Um, and it also abstracts away the instrument that you use to measure energy, right? So if you have a DAC, uh, it's comfortable with that. Uh, we've added some flows in workload automation as, um, as like a, an example of how to build an energy model. Um, 
it's taken us a while to get that right, but uh, you can basically get uh, an agenda file with workload automation and run that on your target after integrating it, and it should spit out the code for an energy model at the end. It's kind of cool. Available on GitHub. Um, a lot of the stuff that people end up doing with uh, scheduler and power performance really is just uh, let, getting a lot of trace for different use cases and trying to figure out what's going on with that. Um, again, like a lot of redundancy there, people write their own scripts, shell scripts, Python, Ruby, whatever. So we try to um, just come up with a framework that allows you to grok ftrace and help you visualize it in interesting ways. So uh, this tool is called Trappy, the trace analysis and Python library. Uh, it uses IPython notebooks with matplotlib, but it also has a JavaScript integration. So uh, you can get, uh, it's really good at massive trace and it shows you a nice uh, snappy way of looking at it in a browser, looking at the events of interest. Uh, there's a lot of um, development going on on this as well. Another thing we wrote is called uh, BART. Uh, I apologize for the nomenclature. There's a young and enthusiastic team that comes up with these names. But BART is the Behavior Analysis Regression Testing Framework. What it really is, is it's a domain-specific language that allows you to specify uh, a particular thread residency pattern that you're interested in looking at, right? So a use case would be, uh, I'm interested in stressing one part of the load balancer and I give it an input uh, RT app load pattern and my expectation is here is the perfect uh, output uh, in terms of thread residency. You can express that thread residency using this DSL and then that becomes a regression check. So now you can throw a lot of F-trace at it and it'll do correlation analysis to tell you whether things are passing or failing. And we've got a emerging EAS test suite that we are expressing using this. Again, available on GitHub. Amit mentioned Idlestat already. Idlestat is cool because of the C state and P state residency st stats you can get for a use case. It also has an energy model integration. So with an energy model input and the residencies for the use case, you can get a representative energy score for a use case, which is really interesting. Yeah, that's, this is the poor man's uh, way of uh, doing yeah. some sort of energy analysis. If you don't have sophisticated uh, uh, power measurement hardware, or you don't have access to the power measurement ra power rails on your on your board. Yeah. Yes. And Kernel Sack is a workhorse that most people use in this space. Uh, written by Steve Rostet. It's a good tool, but it's it's written using GTK, and it's it, it, it sort of starts slowing down a bit if you throw a large trace file at it. So I think what will happen is uh, we spoke to Steve Ross at LPC and uh, KP and the others in the team sort of showed him Trappin and Bart. I think he wants to take up some of those ideas. Something interesting should emerge. We'll see. Uh, Robin, does maybe I can mention sure. we are going to uh, have a demo Friday. Very valid point. Yeah. So on Thursday, uh, oh, is it today? So no, the demo is on Friday, but we, have, we actually have a meeting. Yeah, so there's there's a EAS uh, technical discussion where we are going to dive into some of the policy details tomorrow, uh, and then there is some demos on on Friday where we uh, where we show some of the platforms and how how we've done some of the development. Yeah, I believe there's a session either today or tomorrow. I, I, I apologize, I'm not sure when, but we we are meaning to uh, in in the hacking rooms just show people some of the trap trapping and the bar stuff as well. So uh, you want to look at the discussions on Pathable. I've I've posted a message there uh, with with the timings and the names of our sessions. Uh, if we if we update anything, uh, room numbers or anything, I'll I'll put it in the discussions on Pathable. Yes, yeah. uh, once upon a time we did look at it. It was interesting. I'm just wondering how that compares to these tools. You yeah, know. I think like we're not quite there yet with that, uh, with, with the existing offering. I think what I liked about PyTime Chart was it, it was a little more uh, context aware, right? I mean, you could sort of like have this really neat way of indicating graphically uh, events leading to task wake up, whether someone has posted mm -hmm. a semaphore or whatever, right? We could do that quite easily with Trappy, but uh, we don't use PyTime Chart. Right? Okay. Yes. Is it still maintained? Uh, it seems to be, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. No. No? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think... I'm disappointed. Oh, sorry. I, I, I'd like to apologize on behalf of the universe, but uh, I'm sorry, I'm being, I'm being sarcastic. What I meant was, um, I think it solves a different problem, actually. I think the SysTrace viewer, I think we briefly played with it once upon a time. It gives you a lot of uh, information from a 
Android middleware was yeah, but it, 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 it also based on the F chase. So, and it, if you can support uh, the Citrus viewer, you will really uh, help us to tune the real world okay. workload. That's useful feedback. Uh, we'd like to have that discussion with you. I think the last time yeah. we tried to use Citrus, we found that. I think Android has its own threading libraries, and it repurposes task structs without, it was difficult for us to correlate the, uh, the threading model in Android to actual operating system task structs, and we were getting confused, and we were like, let's just use <coughs> Kernel Shark instead. Yeah. But yeah, we're happy to have that discussion. If, if you want to share some details, perhaps we can consider integrating some of that stuff. Okay. So, um, this is a highly simplified view of how things have panned out in the upstream story. Mm. Linaru did an implementation of um, effectively an integration between CPU idle and the scheduler. That was Nico's patches. That's something we rely on. Uh, there's been an implementation of uh, shared DVFS by Linaru, the mechanics, followed by our policy uh, experiments on top that has all been posted uh, at V3. Is Mike coming in? He's not here. He's right? here. Okay. Um, we posted some of the foundation patches that Amit mentioned, uh, which are introducing things like uh, better accounting, invariant accounting for load tracking and stuff like that. And then Patrick's shed tune RFC v1 went out. We have the LPC. We've got this progression with the RFCs. Um, basically, RFC v5 was the first time where we had an, an initial implementation of all the features we wanted to see in the final solution, right? And from that point onwards, we. Um, we were waiting for some indication from a silicon trial that this stuff is actually heading in the right direction. We started getting that indication, and from that point onwards, we started breaking apart RFC v5 into smaller patch sets, uh, removing the RFC tag where appropriate, and pushing for these to be uh, merged. Right, so our strategy moving forwards is uh, more aggressively towards upstream merging. <coughs> uh, this is a breakdown of the patches. Uh, shed DBFS is at RFC V3. We have a deep dive on uh, some of the issues there. At the LPC, the landscape around shed DBFS has changed a bit because the maintainers called out uh, two critical problem areas. Uh, I don't want to go into those details necessary here, but one of those is now that you're using CPU Freak from the scheduler, CPU Freak is in the hot path of the scheduler, and some of the locking strategies used in CPU Freak core don't gel well with the scheduler. So they want a, RCU locking to be used over there, and we would like to discuss that with our friends here to see who's going to take that up and when we can get some prototypes and stuff like that. Uh, also, the maintainers called out that it's only CFS that is benefiting from shed DBFS, only this completely fair scheduler class. And he wants to see uh, the real time, uh, the other classes also hook into this. So that's some work we want to try and consider taking on. But um, RFC V5 is out. RFC V5 went out to LKML, and then we got some silicon trials going on in the Chromos environment with a partner. So the Chromos Garrett, as Ian mentioned, has an instance of RFC V5, but performance optimization and some debug patches on top of that. Right? Um, there is a, okay, I'm jumping ahead a bit, but we are, we are discussing the creation of an LSK for EAS with Linaru. Uh, we're going to try and seed that with the RFC v5 instance in the Chromos Garrett as a first step. Um, since you mentioned LSK, so the current uh, thinking is that uh, this will be a 3.18 based LSK based on uh, uh, feedback uh, from the members uh, through the steering committee. So if you want to talk about uh, LSK in general, just come and talk to us, please. LSK is kind of interesting because uh, there's an emerging LSK for Juno with a 3.18 kernel with a complete Android stack with Mali GPU support. And that'll have GTS because that's the existing story, right? But if we have another flavor of that, which replaces GTS with EAS, then we have a comparison point starting over there, which is interesting. <coughs> Set tune proposal, the link there, already posted. Um, foundational patches have already been queued for merging, which is really cool. And uh, Yu Yang Du from Intel did a Pelt rewrite, and once saw Morton Dietmar, everyone helped review that, and we also managed to get some of the blocked utilization stuff into that path set. It's been queued as well, which has been really encouraging. Uh, I'm going to make a big deal about this last one later, but uh, basically, people who are using this stuff are doing it 
uh, in their own setups. We would like people to come onto the list and actually just at least give us a tested buy or something, right? Or if you have a problem with the design, say so on LKML. Some partners have done that, and that's critical because it gives the maintainer an indication that there are other serious players who are intending to take this to the next step. Um, bear in mind that the maintainers in this space are people who come from NUMA, HPC, desktop backgrounds, and it's taken us a lot of time to get their attention now, and you know, getting people in will help. So are you saying three minutes, or are you saying hi? Fine. <laughs> um, so, a bit more about the Chromos uh, evaluation we had done with RFC V5. It's a 318 kernel. Um, we're trying to emulate the interactive governor as best as we can with some uh, special mods. There were a bunch of HMP behaviors we had put in, which were benchmark oriented uh, special case behaviors. And uh, we find that a lot of these are emulatable in EAS. So and th that's available in the, the Chrome OS carrot. Um, yeah. Very quick view on results. Um, this is RT app. Well, this is uh, RFC V5 and TC2. Uh, over here, what we're showing is increasing load intensity using RT app. Um, gray is the mainline kernel. It's unfair to compare ES with the mainline kernel because the mainline kernel is not big little aware and this is a big little platform. So we're just uh, introducing one more uh, sort of bar over here, which is mainline plus capacity awareness only. And then we're doing the comparison and showing everything over here. So you know, the interesting thing is, so long as you have capacity available in the system, which you can do stuff with for energy efficiency, obviously EAS is doing a way better job. As you start running out of capacity, the, the bias starts becoming towards, let's not use the energy model, and let's start focusing on performance, right? So you run out of capacity, the, the comparison starts looking worse and worse. Once you come to a saturated task like SysPinch, which is emulating a 100% task over here, uh, you can see that ES is actually consuming more than the mainline. Why is it doing that? Because it's placing the task on the right core, because it's a performance-oriented task, so it will cost you more energy. But that's not the point. The point is you're looking for performance, and the performance goes up as well. So simple synthetic scenarios modeled with RT app is our testing and evaluation strategy. But we're relying on product code lines with Chrome OS and Android to actually extrapolate from this and see whether there's any real benefit with micro use cases. Yes. This is mainline. Shed, tip shed code. Um, summary of sorts. We are working on the LSK. Uh, the expectation that has been set to me by people I've spoken to in the Linaru universe is that 1510 is where we're going to get something which would allow us to make these comparisons. The silicon trial and evaluations are underway using a 318 kernel with Chromos. We have every intention of moving to Android. Uh, we are very interested in speaking to partners who would like to have a collaboration with us on Android. Um, please test. Give us tested buys, act buys, reviews by. Uh, we want to try and conclude some of the Android testing in, within the year if we possibly can. Uh, I've already showed you the, the tools. We have a productization phase that we want to attack in Q1 next year, where we want to uh, try and provide some documentation and stuff like that that, pe that can assist people in uh, you know, deploying the stuff. But that's for Q1 next year. And uh, this is a slightly contrived way of saying that please get on the lists and act some patches, okay? That will be very welcome. ES needs you. It's kind of cheesy, but uh, if you think about it, uh, I've played with a couple of Unix operating systems or Unix-like operating systems. I haven't seen a rich operating system have this sort of energy efficient mechanic outside of academia, right? So it is a big deal. It's changing the heart of the Linux kernel and you should be involved in that to try and help shape it because yeah, it'll be cool. That's it for my side. Questions? Yeah. <coughs> yes. Yeah. So, so I wonder how the IPA interact the e EAS? Very good question. So uh, yes, we have a thermal strategy called IPA, the Intelligent Power Allocator. That is also an energy model driven technique to, uh, if there is thermal load on the system, you want to promote maximized performance within the thermal envelope. It's already been merged in Linux 4.2. Uh, we kept IPA and EAS separate. Why? Because we don't, we're already asking the maintainers to come out of their comfort zone when we're talking energy models, 
if we started talking temperature and task scheduling, they would probably not listen to us at all, right? So we kept these two separate. Now that EA seems to be on its way in slowly, um, we are doing prototypes internally to see how ES and IPA can work together. Right? And sometime in the middle of next year, we feel some of that prototyping will have matured enough to start sharing it with uh, LKML and with partners. There is a strategy for getting ES and IPA to come together. Okay, thank you. Uh, 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 maybe I have missed some of the patches for the CPU idle, uh, but from my understanding, um, later we need to remove the CPU idle, the framework, and we need to use the scheduler to uh, to do the decision. The CPU should to enter which is exactly the idle state. So I'm not sure how this is going on. Yeah. yeah so. We, there was an initiative going on within Lenaro. Uh, Amit, you want to talk about that? So we can never get rid of the CPU idle framework. What we are doing is moving some of the policy to the scheduler. The, the framework is still required, at least the, the platform uh, uh, specific part of the framework is still required because that is how you uh, register all the C states that you support and the latencies uh, for entering those C states. So I think that part of the framework will still always exist. So it's only the policy because of uh, the energy model uh, that will, will move uh, to the scheduler. Uh, there is also uh, some work uh, which we, we've posted in the past around, uh, um, uh, is Daniel here? No? Uh, so we call it the IRQ governor, but basically it's, it's about uh, uh, identifying uh, the next wake-ups uh, and, and making better predictions based on that, uh, on what, what uh, level of C state you want to go to, how deep you can sleep. So there's some work around optimizing that, but that's, uh, that, that can go on in parallel with the EAS. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not a blocker for EAS in that sense. Uh, no, this is not related to Gen PD. We sort of intentionally chose to keep things simple on the CPU idle side in terms of how the scheduler is engaging with CPU idle, but Steve pointed out yesterday that perhaps our existing strategy is a little too naive, as in we simply look for CPUs that are idle when we're waking tasks up and we, we just choose the CPS in, uh, CPU in the shallowest uh, idle state. Uh, but we had a discussion after Steve's point yesterday and we're thinking of some slightly more sophisticated ways of involving CPU idle. But I don't foresee that we'll, like we have like a policy association with DVFS and the scheduler, um, I don't think we'll reach that point with the scheduler and CPU idle personally, but it's a discussion we should have. I mean, there's, there's optimizations we think that are possible, but I don't think they're in the uh, hot path of uh, the rest of the EAS work. That's that's the only thing. Yeah, There's some discussions. We yeah, have this but uh, if if you have ideas around that, uh, feel free to uh, join us in the hacking sessions in the afternoon, where we are going to be discussing some of these things. Sorry, I just said the the channels the the the, the yes the patch has been merged into the main line, right? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, thanks a lot.